This time we're taking a look at Nintendo Power number 40 for September of 1992. A nice round number. Now let's see how nice this issue is. Our cover game of this issue is Felix the Cat. It's another painted cover and I'm not too impressed with this one. Maybe I'm just coming down from the diorama cover we had last issue. In the letters column, the prompt is on where you would like to play your Game Boy games. The responses to this are particularly of interest as the ones printed either generally err on the side of the fantastical or silly, which is fine, but not really as interesting from an anthropological standpoint. We also have a solicitation from Capcom for Robot Masters from Nintendo Power Readers for the next Mega Man game, running in parallel with a similar contest being run in Japan. Our first NES game of the issue is Felix the Cat. Going from the article, the game is a fairly conventional platformer, with Felix's various abilities being provided by his magic bag. The article covers the available power-ups, along with maps of the first three stages and notes on the successive six. Felix the Cat is a fairly decent platformer, the difficulty level is not too high, and the content you're seeing here is somewhat late game content from stage four. The controls are okay, but there are some problems with some enemy placement in relation to platforms. The game does have limited continues, which is something of a bugaboo of mine, but otherwise the game is solid, and though nothing really stands out about the game. Though marking what will be a trend for this issue, at least for the NES titles, this game is absurdly rare, running for close to $100 on eBay as of this recording, which I will say is too much for this game if you're just planning on buying a copy just to play, not because you're trying to put together a collection. I have previously covered the Super Nintendo version of Prince of Persia, and now we have the NES version with some notes on the game from stage 4 on. Prince of Persia is a game that needs more buttons than two, or arguably, arguably four. The NES version has several problems with context-sensitive commands not working quite right, and the animations not shifting fluidly between each other, though that latter point is more related to the hardware, requir hardware specifications of the NES over those of the Super Nintendo. Now this is a damn shame, because that last point is something that the Game Boy version of the game managed to pull off, even if it couldn't pull off a sufficiently sized screen and issue free controls. I recommend sticking with the Super Nintendo version of this game instead. Next up is Little Samson, which is the rarest game I've covered thus far. We have maps of the first six stages and notes on stages seven and eight. Little Samson is an interesting game which plays a little like Mega Man, which makes sense because one of the original designers of Mega Man worked on this game. However, this game has some distinct issues that are separate from Mega Man, particularly related to the level design. Rather than switching weapons, you have a party of four characters, each with distinct abilities. With Lickle, who I believe is meant to be the titular Little Samson, being the sort of stock Mega Man character whose abilities will work in all scenarios. To the game's credit, the game does a tutorial level for each member of the party, which works fairly well. Sort of. I say sort of because, for example, in the tutorial level for Golem, the large stone guy, the level design almost works for teaching you Golem's abilities and Golem's limitations. Except for the problem that Golem can't dodge, and he gets too many enemies thrown at him too fast to take them, take them all out. On the one hand, throwing some cheap hits in would make sense. He teaches the player that Golem's mobility is limited, but he's got enough hit points that he can take a hit or two without too many problems. However, the amount of enemies thrown at the player through these sections are enough as to make what would be a straightforward tutorial level incredibly tedious. Still, the game is fun, but from a non-collector standpoint, I don't know if it's worth the incredibly high price that this game regularly asks for. In the classified information column, we have notes on the roulette tells in Casino Kid 2. And in this installment of the Legend of Zelda comic, Link rescues the first princess and gets a lead on Zelda's location. Starting off with the Game Boy titles, we have The Jetsons Robot Panic, based on the Hanna-Barbera science fiction sitcom. We have maps of the first three levels, along with notes on stages four through six. This game is really bad. Really bad. Between force scrolling on the levels with Elroy and a jump that near as I can tell is impossible on Jane's level, this game is simply not worth playing. 
my best guess for why this game was featured in Nintendo Power at all is because at the time of this issued release, there were simply not enough Game Boy games out to fill this issue in terms of games of quality. Next up is Dr. Franken, and I have no idea what type of game this is or how it's structured. It looks like some sort of adventure game where you collect items to solve puzzles and explore an environment in a non-linear fashion. The magazine is a map of levels 3, 4, and 5 of the house and a flowchart of the items you need to progress in the game, along with notes on floors 6 and 7. This game is also not very good. It wants to be a non-linear adventure game where you need to collect a series of items in a particular order in while well, exploring an environment in with a certain degree of freedom. That's the non-linear part. The linear part is you've got to collect the items in order. So, hybrid of the two. But you're not solving any puzzles with the items. You're not giving any clues in the game as to what is the ideal order to those items. So if you don't have the flowchart in the Nintendo Power Guide, you are in something of trouble. Additionally, you're not given any clues as to what items are where, leading leaving you to wander around aimlessly listening to a admittedly decent chiptune version of the Moonlight Sonata. Perhaps what makes the failure of this game a little more disappointing than the failure of, for example, the Jetsons Robot Panic, is if this game had given the player a little guidance. For example, clues and level environments telling him, telling the player where certain items are, or what the ideal item order is, it could have been a much better game. Moving on, we have Kingdom Crusade, a fantasy strategy game for the Game Boy. If Archon was chess turned into an action strategy game, Kingdom Crusade is Stratego turned into an action strategy game with a side of Go. The aim of the game is to capture a collection of forts on a map. Each side is made up of a selection of characters, each with their own special abilities, and to win, you have to capture, well, all of the forts on that map. You do this by having characters move through each of the squares around a castle, and finally the square that has the castle. Through this process, you will also fight the characters that your opponent has in real-time combat. And what this does, ultimately, is turn this game into a real-time strategy game. When you are on the map screen, moving characters through the map screen, or selecting which characters you want to do and moving them around, your opponent is doing the same thing, also in real time. This is basically the first real-time strategy game on a portable system, though not the first on consoles, as Herzog's Y predates this game. It's a remarkably inventive game, and if I had any real complaints about it, it's that this game is held back by the hardware limitations of the Game Boy. Sadly, this game has never gotten a PC or console version, which I think would clear up some of the game's limitations, particularly in relation to stuff on screen and controls. Wrapping up the Game Boy gar titles, we have Barbie Game Girl, a collection of Barbie-themed mini-games. I am skipping this. These collections have never been good in a very gross we're making a shovelware game for girls, because, and we're not even going to try to make a good game because it's for girls sort of way. In Super Mario Adventure, Mario and Luigi are trapped in the ghost house and get bothered by booze. The comic timing of this, well, comic, really shows in this installment. In Counselor's Corner, we have a whole bunch of tips for Link to the Past. In Nestor's Adventures, Nestor is playing Wings 2, and the advice is to level up your pilot's mechanical stat to maximum so you can do a split S and other similar maneuvers. Moving on to Super Nintendo titles, we have Dino City, a prehistoric platformer. The guide has maps of some of the game through Stage 4. The article implies there are branching paths through some of the levels, but there isn't any information or much information on where those branches occur aside from the first level. Dino City is based on the game, or about the film, Adventures in Dino City, and it's also not very good. The majority of this problem with the game is you take a lot of cheap hits. Three main ways. The first is through the immunity period for enemies. When you hit an enemy with attack, they have an immunity period that lasts for a couple seconds, during which time you cannot damage them. 
However, the enemies are not stun locked during this period, so while you cannot attack them, they can attack you. The second is from several of the jumps in the game. These jumps put you on rising platforms with an enemy above them and an elevated platform to their right. The idea behind this from a design standpoint is clearly apparent looking at it that you should be able to jump off the platform before the enemy is able to attack you. In practice, if you're able to jump high enough to get off the platform and theoretically land on the new platform, the, you have entered the attack box of the enemy and thus you get hit. The third is in the jump pads you need to use to traverse the environments. For some goddamn reason, these pads switch between being bounce pads and spikes. So you have to get the timing when you jump on and when you jump off them to get a boost. Perfect. However, there are sections of this game where you're expected to jump from bounce pad to bounce pad in sequence. And by the time you begin to descend, pads have switched from being bounce pads to spike pads, and thus you take damage. And all of these things are things which could have been fixed. In particular, changing the speed of the cycle for the bounce pad, bounce spike pads. Just that on its own would have made the game work much better. Or lowering some of the platforms you have to jump onto with the, well, rising platforms. Or letting you stun your enemies when you hit them. And what makes this all the more disappointing is this is a game that is developed by Irem, who should know better. They have made some very good games, which we have covered thus far in this series. But sadly, they didn't do better in this game. Thus, don't play this game. Next up is Soul Blazer, Blazer, a JRPG for the Super Nintendo. We have maps of the first six areas of the game. Soul Blazer is a game that I reviewed back when I was doing this series as a prose series as opposed to a video series as now. It's a very interesting and fun Japanese RPG, though it's a game that is not without its issues in the later portions of the game. Some of the later fights, from my own experience and from what I picked up from reviews and podcasts discussing the game and the even later fights and how far I've gotten, get into a real slugfest territory with those boss fights, with victory being based on more picking up every monster lair for the XP for, for purposes of grinding for the later boss fights over being able to get through on significantly skill. This is probably why I've never seen this game run at a Games Done Quick event. Next up is Clue, which is based on the board game, and I'll say that this is a board game that I've never seen adapted before or since for consoles. Clue is a rather impressive adaptation of the board game. They get the rules and tone of the board game right, though it does have one significant flaw that the board game has, and that this doesn't really house rule around. That moving through the manor is determined through random dice rolls, which really only serve to pad out the game. Like, you would not change the gameplay in the slightest, and would certainly like speed things up, if you just simply eliminated random movement and just determined what order people would go in through the dice roll in that regard, and just play it that way. It would be a faster way of playing the game, and you'd still have the same general tone of fun. This is a game that you will need to have notepad and paper to play, as the game does not track the information that you've picked up from interrogations and suggestions over the course of playing the game. Still, it's fun, and it's just as faithful an adaptation as the earlier adaptations of Monopoly. Speaking of which, we have a Super Nintendo version of Monopoly, and this is a game that I've seen adapted before, and having played this game before and reviewed this game before for the NES version, and considering that this is effectively a higher resolution version of the NES title, I will skip this game for this episode. Wrapping up the Super Nintendo titles, we have Super Bowling, the first bowling video game that I've seen covered this far, and this is also the first game this far that I've observed where you can choose the race and the, and the gender of your avatar. The selection is still fairly fall, small. You can pick either a white guy or gal or a black guy or gal. There are no Asian or Hispanic people, but it's a nice touch. Super Bowling is a fun little bowling game with a couple interesting game modes. The standard bowling competition is 
under Turkey Bowl with a second game mode called Golf, which involves performing a series of trick shots. Now in golf, some of these shots involve scenarios that don't actually appear in an actual bowling match, like having a row of four pins at your sort of second rank of pins, then two pins in the third rank, but other scenarios that you could encounter do show up, like for example the classic 7-10 split. It is a really good way to learn the physics of the game and improve your more traditional bowling game in this game, outside of practice mode. In the Now Playing column, we have a super off-road spin-off uh, titled Danny Sullivan's Indie Heat, and the Super Nintendo has a new shoot 'em up with Strike Gunner. In the top 20 ranking, there hasn't been much change, which is notable, as Street Fighter is still not in the top 10 on the Super Nintendo ranking. In the Celebrity Profile column, the subject of this issue is Tim Allen, who, as of, thi as of this issue, is just starting up his sitcom Home Improvement. Now, since then, he has done his various Toy Story-related projects, and is currently has a sitcom titled Last Man Standing, which is basically covering the same material as Home Improvement, except nowadays. In the Pack Watch column, we have a bunch of big titles being shown here. Hopefully, I'll get to cover in the future. At least two I know I will. Death Valley Rally, Super Star Wars, and Wing Commander. I'm going to start single, singling out the Japan Watch titles here, as this column has been proof that Nintendo has been paying attention to the import games market, perhaps realizing that the Super Nintendo is a few snips with a wire cutter away from being the perfect system for import titles. This issue, Ogre Battle, is the featured title, and this it's also one which we do eventually later get in the U.S. My picks of this issue are entirely on the Super Nintendo side or other pick of this issue. Super Bowling is a game that is far more fun than it has any right being. It would make a fun, for a fun evening, either alone or with friends. Clue almost made the list, but unfortunately, the nature of the mechanics of the board game version with the die rolling kind of, well, makes the game not work as well. Once again, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe to this channel. Subscribe and get you notified when future episodes come out. And liking lets me know that you enjoyed the episode. The video on the right will be of the previous episode of Nintendo Power Retrospectives, if you want to go see what I reviewed previously that on that show. And the video on the left will take you to the previous episode of Breaking It All Down, while well, you'll get to see what I covered there. And below that will be a link to my Patreon page if you wish to back the show. Backing the show can get you a mention in the credits, and also, depending on your level of support, you can determine what I do future Let's Plays of on Breaking It All Down and what else I review on that show as well. So go ahead and click on that and back the show. Also, backing the show helps me get the show out more often and improve the production quality of the show, which is good for everybody. Once again, thank you very much for watching and see you next time.